So, hey, um, hello everybody. We welcome today William de Graaf from University Trento, uh, who's an expert on computational algebra and the uh, author of several books on the, the subject in the field. And um, he makes a great contribution uh, in our um, choice paper is um, Mikhail Baravoy on classification of the tree form in Anai. Uh, but today he should speak about another classification. That's the classification of the qubit and the uh, uh, restate, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So oh, please, yes. William. Oh, well, yeah. oh, well, well, thank you. Yeah, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to. And again, I, I'm sorry that I, I couldn't make it to Prague, although I did manage to find very cheap tickets, but anyway, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so this is, well, uh, this is a project together with Aiko Dietrich and Alessio Marani and Marcos Aurelia. And maybe I say a little bit of why we did this. Well, actually, with with Heiko, we got we got a grant some years ago, and Marcos Olivia was a postdoc in this in this um, project, and the grant was about well doing real orbits, and uh, <clears throat> then we, we decided to look at this at this at this particular problem uh, for the real orbits, uh, but in order to be able to do the real orbits, well I will I will give more details later, but uh, to do the real orbits we had to do the complex orbits as well. And then we found that somehow in the literature that was not really, had not been done yet for some reason, although many people have worked on it, but they're not, they didn't really go into uh, a lot of detail, I would say. Um, and therefore we, well, actually we wrote two papers on the complex orbits and then the real orbits. Um, okay. So first half of the, the first part of the talk will be on the complex things and then we go to the real things. Okay, um, so what is the thing? Well, um, it comes from, from uh, quantum information theory. And one of the main things that are of interest in quantum information theory is a representation of SL2C, the group SL2C to the N, to the n-fold tensor product of C2 with itself, right? And the, the action is here, it's a very explicit action. So the the ith component of, of, the, of the group acts on the ith component in the tensor um, power, right? And uh, well, in quantum information, this is called, um, so the, the, the classification of the orbits is called the classification of n qubit states under Schlock operator. So in the rest of the, so I, I, I'm sorry, but I don't know much about this. Huh? I don't know much about quantum information or quantum mechanics or, or physics, unfortunately. I very much loved, would love to know more about it, but it's, well, yeah, uh, I don't. So in the rest of the talk, I will, I will be concerned with classification, uh, uh, the classification of these orbits, no? Okay, that's, that's an algebraic problem, and that's, I feel much more comfortable with that. So, um, what is known? Well, apparently, so this, for NS2 and NS3, these are two things that I just got out of the literature, I didn't check them. Apparently for n is equal to two, there are two orbits and for n is equal to three, there are six. And they have been well studied and they're well known. Uh, so for n is equal to four, um, there are a few classifications of orbits that are in, in, present in the literature. Um, I cannot mention all of them, um, but I mentioned two. Uh, there's one, of, uh, one in a paper of 2002 by a group of authors from Belgium um, headed by Verstraete. And then a few years later, Gerenthal and Djokovic redid the same classification and they corrected a few errors in the Verstraete classification, but they did the same, essentially the same thing. And what comes out of there is that every orbit, they, 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 they obtain nine classes of elements. And every, uh, the, the theorem is that every orbit has a representative in exactly one of those classes. However, uh, any given class has representatives of um, an infinite number of orbits, right? 
and it is not clear whether they are uh, well it's not given how to find out if two elements of the same class are conjugate or not for example all right okay and the second classification that I want to mention is not really published, but um, it's in uh, lecture notes of Nolan Wallach. And he uses um, a so called cost and Rallis theory, which is a paper from the uh, beginning of the 70s, I think. Um, and, and he obtains a classification which is similar to our classification, um, but not his classification, not quite correct. So he, he didn't get all the computations right. And uh, well, Okay. And also miss well also the well, well doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, well for n n n at least five, a sort of meaningful classification of orbits is to believe to be out of reach. Uh, of course the question is what 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 do you mean by classification of orbits if there's an infinite number of orbits, but anyway. Um uh, for n, in any case, for n is equal to n greater or equal to five, the 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 problem is much 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 more complicated than for um, n up to four. Okay, good. So what do we do in this for this? Well, our main result is that we have eighty-seven classes. <laughs> so instead of nine, we have eighty-seven. Ah, one one thing that I should say is that in the uh, Verstraete classification. They also allow permutations of the tensor factors. Okay, so you get more classes if you don't allow that, right? So you can permute. So in this tensor product here, you can you can permute the factors, and you get well, you get so you, they actually consider an, an an action of a slightly bigger group. Let's put it like that. But anyway, we don't do that. Um, so we get eighty-seven classes. Um, and what about these classes? Well, we have 31 classes uh, that consist of one single element, right? So every orbit has a representative in exactly one of the 87 classes. And 31 classes consists of a, consist of a single element. So that means that they are just orbit representatives. So we get 31 orbits. And then we have 56 classes that consist of an infinite number of elements, right? And uh, two elements of the same infinite class have the same stabilizer in the group SL2 to the fourth. So we also classify the stabilizers of, of elements up to conjugacy. Yeah, so, um, so that's one thing of the infinite classes. And the second thing is that if I have two elements of the same infinite class, they are conjugate under SL2 to the fourth, if and only if they're conjugate under and a, and a finite group which is explicit, explicitly given, right? So we can solve conjugacy and and we determine stabilizers. Yeah. And this is all very this is yeah this is very important for actually being able to do the classification. So we'll see that later. Um, ah, by the way, if you have questions, please interrupt. Huh? So I don't mind being interrupted at all. So William, you mentioned about the uh, constant and the run list. Paper. Yes. So that means that's a false symmetric here yeah? or a space. Yes, yes, yes. So and this, a this, little gradedly algebra. That's right. Yes, yes. I will come to that in a minute, and you will see. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so our method is based on on work of Wienberg from the seventies, basically, and the main paper there is maybe Wienberg's paper, which is called the Wild Group of a Graded Lie Algebra from nineteen seventy six. And then an important paper was uh, by Wienberg and Elias Willi. Um, it, who gave a classification of the three vectors of nine dimensional space. And then there are two papers by uh, Antonian and Antonian Elashvili, who do um, orbit classifications in symmetric pairs of maximal rank using the same, the same methods as in the Wienberg Elashvili paper. Let's put it like that. Um, so, um, Helen, could I, yes? could I uh, clarify something? Um, yes. So, you say that in the uh the 31 uh in 31 of the classes they consist of a single element do you mean yeah. a single array i mean you could always multiply any element of c2 to to the four by a yeah 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 array. well no no uh it's it's a single element it means that it's just one representative of one orbit um, if, you, if you multiply okay. it, you get another representative of the same orbit but it's oh. not in the class so the class just just consists of one element well, 
I'm okay. Uh, and it, it, I'm, it just, I'm, I'm then a little bit confused about. Uh, okay, so your 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 classes consist of of multiple orbits. Yeah. Yes, they have representatives uh -huh. of multiple orbits. Yes, the, the infinite classes they have representative of an infinite number of orbits. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. And so, so maybe I'm just uh, slow in catching up, but. So the, the orbits are under this action of SL, uh, SL2C. That's right. And, but what was, by what principle are you grouping them into classes then? Ah, yes, well, 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 we will come to that. Ah, I see, okay, okay. all right. <laughs> I, will, okay. I will explain what these classes, what, what the 31 classes that, that consist of a single element mean and what the 56 classes mean. Okay, all right, okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> But of course, it's it's a question. Of course, if you have an inf if you have a case, if you have a, if you need to, I mean, it's a general sort of maybe philosophical question, if you like. If you have a group action on a space where there's an infinite number of orbits, then of course the question is what classification? What does classification mean, right? Because you cannot make a list. You have to have some. Well, you have to classify them somehow into groups, so that you still get something finite. Yeah. But anyway, yes, I will. I will come to it. Okay. Um, now to uh, the remark of Van. Um, so uh, in order to do this and to use these methods, so, so now this is all based on the, on this, let's say, Wienberg and so on stuff. Yeah? Um, we have to construct uh, the representation of SL2 to the fourth on this fourth tensor power in a different way. And here is a rather explicit way of doing it. Okay. So there are more, there's more than one way, but anyway, this is this is one, one possibility. You take this matrix M, which is an eight times eight matrix, which has a four times four identity matrix here and a four times four identity matrix here, and we take the the, the corresponding orthogonal group, right? SO8, which consists of these matrices. Um, and why do we take this M? Well, that's because it makes computations, which I will not do here easier than for another M, let's say. No, this is, a, this is a convenient M to work with, just for that reason. Okay, and this is an algebraic group, and we take its Lie algebra, which is has this, this definition, SO8C. This is a simple Lie algebra of type D4. And uh, now we take a matrix D, which is a diagonal matrix, which is explicitly given like this. And it's not difficult to see that conjugation by D leaves invariant the group and the Lie algebra. No, so you take, and since the inverse of D is D itself, conjugation is just D times U times D. And so we get a map from the Lie algebra to itself and the group to itself. And since this is conjugation, this is actually an automorphism of order two. Okay, fine. Um, so since it's no automorphism of order two, I can divide the Lie algebra into eigenspaces of eigen, eigenvalue one and eigenvalue minus one. And the subspace of uh, corresponding to eigenvalue one has, is a subalgebra. And well, and the, the other space is just a subspace. And we can do the same or something similar with the G where we just consider the, the group of fixed points of the automorphism. And we take its, its identity component. And then this G naught is an algebraic subgroup of the big group G. And the Lie algebra of the G naught is the little G naught. Fine. That's okay. And uh, just to, to, um, to, to, to add some terminology here is that uh, this, this pair G, G naught is called a symmetric pair. And it's a symmetric pair of maximal rank for reasons that I will, I will uh, tell you about later. Um, so this, this pertains to the, to the theory of, of uh, symmetric pairs. And this is the reason why uh, the, the cost and Rellis paper comes in, well, because they, they consider this kind of setup. Okay. Now we can let the, the group G, so this SO8, act on the Lie algebra G by conjugation. Well, that's the general thing that the algebraic group acts on its Lie algebra. And then it's easy to see that the, gene, the, the, the subgroup G naught stabilizes the subspace G1. Yeah. And then we have a few facts which can be figured out. 
And the first fact is that the subalgebra G naught is isomorphic to four, the direct sum of co four copies of SL2. Right, so we don't know that algebra by four SL2. Now, if you have an isomorphism from that four SL2 to G naught, that you can lift to a surjective morphism of algebraic groups of SL2 to the fourth knot. Okay, and then using this, uh, this, this map, we can make the space G1 into an SL24 module, right? Because you take an element of SL24, you map it into G0, and that element acts on G1, on this space G1 here. And it just so happens, right? One can check this that the resulting representation is equivalent to the representation row four that I was interested in at the beginning. So C2, tensor C2, tensor C2, tensor C2. Okay, so now you have a rather complicated way of making a representation that was given in a very easy way before. So the reason is why you do that, right? Why make things more complicated? And the big reason is that um, embedding it into this simple Lie algebra gives you enormous amount of tools to work with. Ah, yes, well, that was the next slide then. So why do we do this? Um, yeah, so now we have our module that we're interested in as a subspace of a simple Lie algebra of type D4, so SO8. And the big thing is, this is a very classical fact, is that you can do in, in simple Lie algebras in, in characteristic zero, you can do Jordan decomposition. That means that if you have an element of the Lie algebra, uh, there are, uh, X, there are uh, unique and semi-simple and nilpotent elements uh, such that X is the sum of them and the S and the N commute. And here there is just to, to, to remind that if an element is called semi-simple, if the adjoint map, which is just left multiplication by the element, is semi-simple or, well, same thing with nilpotent, right? So the definitions of semi-simple and nilpotent, they depend on the adjoint map. Uh, that's a linear map, therefore you have, you have these notions. And one of the key results, also in the classification of simple Lie algebra, is that there is this Jordan decomposition. And now it's not so difficult to see right, using this automorphism theta, is that if you have something in the, the subspace G1, then it's nilpotent and semi-simple parts also lie in G1, right? And this then immediately divides our orbits into three groups, uh, nilpotent, semi-simple, and mixed, right? So you can have orbits of nilpotent elements, orbits of semi-simple elements, and then orbits of elements that are neither nilpotent nor semi-simple, so they're called mixed. Hmm? Okay, so if you want, I already have here a, a, a very small, a very sort of, um, a very crude orbit classification, right? Because I, I now have three classes, namely nilpotent orbits, semi-simple orbit, and mixed orbits. Uh, so, but we want to refine this. Yeah? So the, the idea is always to start with, a, sort of to divide it into classes and then refine until you cannot no longer refine it. Okay, so yeah, um, so the classification problem is also um, divided into three, in three classification problems. And we first come to the nilpotent orbits and I, I, I say very little about it. Um, yes, uh, there, there are, so there, there, there's a, uh, there, uh, one, one basic theorem here is that there's a finite number of nilpotent orbits and there are various methods to classify them. Um, and one of them is due to Weinberg, which uses so-called carrier algebras. And another method uh, uses so-called SL2 triples. So let me go briefly into that, but very briefly. Um, so if you have something in G1, which is nilpotent, then it lies in, in a subalgebra in the, in the Lie algebra G, isomorphic to SL2. So there, there is an H in the G0 and an F in the G1 such that HEF is a so-called SL2 triple, which means that they, they satisfy these commutation relations of SL2. And this is something that you can do because you are in the Lie algebra. You can, you know, if you just have a module, then there is no way you can, you can find subalgebra because there's no algebra structure. Okay, 
So this is uh, definitely very much dependent on the fact that you, you, you are in a Lie algebra. Now, uh, how to classify now these, these SL2 triples, if you like. Uh, well, one way of doing it is looking at the nil potent. Uh, so you, you, you again, you, you go back to your big Lie algebra of type D4G and the nil potent orbits in there have been classified also in terms of SL2 triples. And using that, so I'm not going to tell you how, but using this, you can find finite set uh, in G naught, big H in G naught, such that each nil potent orbit lies, has, a, has a representative that lies in SL2 triple with its first element H in this, in this big set, big H. Yeah? It's a big set maybe, but it's finite. So then you run over this big set H and you see whether uh, they, these elements correspond to an SL2 triple. Yeah? And you can check that using the following theorem, which I will not go into, but I just, I just flash it in front of your eyes. Um, well, I, I'm not going to go into it, so maybe just don't read it. <laughs> but you can believe me, this is, this is a, this, by this theorem, we can decide whether a given element H lies in an SL2 triple or not. And uh, like that. And um, the result is, so the main thing is probably that in the result is that in G1, there are 31 nil potent orbits, including zero. Okay. And these are the 31 classes that consist of a single element because they are just 31 orbits. So I just take one representative of each orbit and I get 31 classes. Okay. Um, well, instead of going to this theorem, I, I show you maybe uh, I show you how uh, that, so I've, I've implemented this years ago in the, so now I don't know which screen I should take this. <laughs> I've implemented this in GAP and I just show you the, uh, well, I just show how, how we can do this. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, again, I will not go into the details here. Uh, Uh, uh -huh. this is very interesting. Why doesn't it do it? Find out order. Ah, I forgot inner. Sorry. So I first have to define the automorphisms, the automorphism of type uh, of the the algebra type D D four of the grid of um of order two, and then I can say, uh, new potent orbits, and I have to take the second one for this. Well, I have to figure, I have to figure out the details, right? But anyway, I will, and there they are. And you see, you get, you immediately get a list and uh, it has 30 elements because the, the zero is not included here. And the, the, the answer is just a list of SL2 triples. Yeah, so we have to, um, and it also actually says a little bit of what it, do, what it does. It says that it constructed this set of 62 cartons to be checked. Yeah, so this is the big set H, has in this case, 62 elements. And then it all checks them and then you get 30 elements. And well, so this can be done automatically. No? Uh, so that for every algorithmically uh, algebra, you did uh, such a program William or no? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, that's great. And is that free or yeah? Yes, 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 yes. Download GAP and you have it. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the, these are the 31 uh, nil potent orbits. And uh, so these are the 31 classes that consist of one element. So then we come to the semi simple orbits. Um, and uh, well, classifying semi simple orbits. Uh, is based on several results of Winberg. And for that, we first have a, a definition of a so-called Cartan subspace. So you, <clears throat> in G1, a Cartan subspace in G1 is a maximal subspace consisting of commuting semi-simple elements, right? Uh, this is, it's a kind of, uh, it's a kind of um, definition which is similar to the definition of maximal torus, right? If you have a if you have an algebraic group or a, or a Lie algebra, you can say maximal torus is a sub is a maximal subalgebra consisting of commuting semi-simple elements. Now this is something similar, but then in, in the G1. 
And um, uh, one important theorem of Weinberg says that two Cartan subspaces um, in G1 are conjugate under the group G0. And from that, it follows that every semi simple orbit has a representative in the given Cartan subspace because you can take an element of your semi simple orbit and that, and that lies in the maximal subspace consisting of commuting semi simple elements. And so it lies in the Cartan subspace, which is then conjugate to the given Cartan subspace. And therefore, your element is conjugate to an element in the given Cartan subspace. Okay. Um, and then um, some more definitions also due to Finberg, I would say. So if you have a sub Cartan subspace C, then you define these objects here. So you define the normalizer in G0 of C, which consists of all elements in the group that map the space C into itself. And then you have the centralizer of C, which consists of all elements of the group that are the identity. So the subgroup of the normalizer consisting of all elements that are, that are the identity on the Cartan subspace. And then you take the quotient, right? And this is a kind of wild group. In fact, it's called the little wild group sometimes. And uh, another theorem of it's uh, Wienberg says that it's a finite group. And two elements of the Cartan subspace are G0 conjugate, so conjugate under the group G0, which in our case is, let's say, you can be, can be seen as SL2 to the fourth, uh, if and only if they're conjugate under this small, uh, uh, under this uh, finite group W0. So somehow this, this, this solves, in some sense, the classification of semi-simple elements because you take a Cartan subspace, you figure out what this uh, vial group W0 is, and then you have one class of semi-simple elements and you know you can decide conjugacy, right? But uh, this can be uh, refined. Oh, no, well, <clears throat> before I say a bit about refining it, I explain what uh, in our case what it's what it is so we have that the g1 is isomorphic as a, as a module to the c the, the fourth tensor power of c2 right as sl2 to the fourth module and then we we, we, we take a basis of c2 which we denote by e0 and e1 and then we use this notation for tensors right this is this comes from quantum information theory so in all papers that i know of that i've seen <laughs> in quantum information theory, they abbreviate uh, such a tensor by such uh, in, in such in such a way. Right, that's the quantum information way of doing it. Okay, and using that, it's actually much shorter, as you see. Doing that, we have a Cartan subspace in. Yeah. 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 Oh. We have a Cartan subspace uh, spanned by these four elements. Well, I mean, this is just one Cartan subspace. It's the same. This also is present in the paper of Strate, for example. So it's well known. Uh, these elements uh, span a Cartan subspace. Fine. Uh, you see the nice elements. There's some symmetry to it. If you change zero, exchange zero and one, they're all, uh, they're all, um, uh, they're, they are, um, they are invariant. Anyway, that's the Cartan subspace, and you can work with that one. Um, and in this case, we have that the C, the Cartan subspace, is also a Cartan subalgebra of the big Lie algebra G. And that's why this is called a symmetric pair of maximal rank. So, William, uh, yeah. maybe you're not aware that we don't see your slides right now. We still see the terminal window. Oh, you don't see the slides. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yes, I wasn't aware of that. I'm sorry for that. So maybe I should go back a little bit. Uh, yes, I wasn't aware of it. Where are my slides, actually? Ah, oh, there. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> let me go back then, yes. So we did, ah, yes, we were here, yes. So let me do this again. Um, <laughs> okay, so, um, um, yeah. So that was basically written what I, what I, what I said. So the Cartan subspace is a maximal subspace of co consisting of commuting semi-simple elements. There is this theorem by Wienberg that says that two Cartan subspaces are conjugate under G0. And uh, that immediately implies that every semi-simple orbit has a representative in a given Cartan subspace. Yeah? So I take one Cartan subspace and every semi-simple orbit has a point in this Cartan subspace. Okay. 
And then we define these things. So we for a given cut and subspace, we define its normalizer. It's centralizer, so its normalizer consists of all elements in the group that map the cut and subspace to itself. And the centralizer is a subgroup of that, which consists of all elements that act as the identity in the cut and subspace. And then we take the quotient. And then uh, there's a theorem of Wienberg uh, that says that uh, this W naught is a finite group. And two elements of the cut and subspace are G naught conjugate if and only if they are W naught conjugate. Right, so I can decide conjugacy. So not only I have that every semi-simple orbit has a point um, in this in this cut on subspace, but I can also decide when they are because it's a finite group. I can decide when two elements are conjugate. Um, okay, fine. So now in our case, so this was, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry for that. I, did, I explained this without showing it. So therefore, uh, this is probably difficult to understand. <laughs> I didn't show it. Um, I will not do this again. So I'll just remain with slides now. So I don't, <laughs> I will not go <laughs> to other screens. Um, so you let E0, E1 be a basis of C2. And we abbreviate the tensor like this by in this notation like that, right? That's the notation used in, in quantum information theory. Um, and then <clears throat> these four elements, they form a, a cut on, they span a cut on subspace and it's a well-known thing. So we didn't invent it or we didn't find it. Um, it's already in the literature. And um, uh, this C actually has dimension four and therefore it's also a, a, a cut on subalgebra sub of G because G is a simple Lie algebra of type D4. And therefore, this symmetric pair that I was saying uh, I was talking about earlier is is called of is, is said to be of maximal rank because it has rank four, which is in maximal it, it is the maximal rank because you cannot have uh, the, the uh, subspace of commuting semi simple elements can have has maximal dimension four in in, in simple Lie algebra of rank four. So yeah, and uh, the group W naught you can also prove that is isomorphic to the Weyl group of the corresponding root system. So it's, it's, it's the Weyl group of type D4, and it's a group of order 192 in this case. So that's very rather small group. Um, and now we come to, to refining the classification of, so as I said before, we already have a classification of semi-simple elements because we have our cut on subspace and we can say, well, that's it, right? And that's the group, that's, that's the class. In fact, that, that's one, one of the classes of the Verstaate classification, for example, one of the nine classes. But we can refine this, and this works in the following way. Um, so this is all uh, this is all from the from the paper by Wienberg and Elashvili, or the, the let's say the ideas, yeah, not 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 the application to this particular case. Um, so if you take a, an element of your Cartan subspace, you look at its stabilizer in W naught, okay. So the WP is, consists of all elements that stabilize P. And it can be shown that this WP is generated by reflections because this W naught is a while, is a while group. It's, it's, it's generated by reflections, right? That's well general thing for while groups. And the WP is also generated by reflections. So it's a so-called reflection subgroup. And now what you define is, is the so-called CP, which is the subspace of all elements Q in C such that Q is stabilized by the same things that stabilize P. So Q is stabilized by all elements also in, in WP. And you define the CP naught as the subspace or the subset of elements that is exactly, that, whose stabilizer is exactly the WP. So who has, has the same stabilizer as P, right? So CP naught consists of all elements in CP uh, that are, are not stabilized by more elements than P. Okay. Uh, that means that, that, that the CP naught is a Sariski open set in CP. And moreover, um, if you get two of these spaces, so you take a P and a Q, and you take CQ naught and CP naught, right, two of these subsets, they are conjugate under an element of the Weyl, of the Weyl group, if and only if the corresponding stabilizers are conjugate by the same element. Aha. 
And that means that if you if you now look at these kind of sub of, of CQ naught spaces or or no, they are actually Tsarisky open sets in, in, in vector spaces. Um, they are classified somehow by conjugate, conjugate, conjugate classes of reflection subgroups of the Waal group. So now what you do is we classify all reflection subgroups of W0 up to conjugacy. And for each such subgroup, you have to check actually whether there is a P such that U, is, if, you, if you have a reflection subgroup U, we have to check whether there is a P such that U is WP. Because not all reflection subgroups need to arise as WP. That's a little point. Well, but once you've done, you've done that, you know, you obtain a finite number of points, P1 to PM, such that each semi symbol orbit has a representative in exactly one of these CPI nodes, right? Because, well, that, that follows from these results here above. Um, and moreover, you, you can define another little finite group, which is a quotient of a subgroup of the, of the vial group W0. Now, I will not go into it what exactly it is here. It is written, the formula is written, but it doesn't really matter. You find, starting from the overall group, you find some subgroup, or you find some, some other small group, and two elements of one CPI node are G naught conjugate, if and only if they're conjugate under this small group. Okay, fine. And a very, very important fact is that two elements of the same CPI naught have the same stabilizer in SL2 to the fourth, right? So if I, and that will be very important in the sequel. So it will, it's, it's the whole rest, or well, the whole rest, I don't know, but many, many things will not, would not be possible if this was not true, right? So these um, semi simple elements are now sort of split in a finite number of groups, and each group has. And potentially an infinite number of orbits. But all orbits in, in, in the same group have the same, sta have the same stabilizer, right? All, all, all elements in the same group have the same stabilizer. Okay. Well, uh, in the way we do it, it's a little bit different, actually. Um, if you look in the paper that we've written, <laughs> we don't work uh, with reflection subgroups, but we, we, we classify root subsystems. So a reflection subgroup is generated by reflections. Those reflections, they generate a root subsystem, and we rather classify root subsystems because that's easier. <clears throat> also, because Dinkin has already given an algor algorithm for that in the 50s. So we use Dinkin's algorithm to classify root subsystems. And if you then have a uh, the, 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 the reflection subgroup corresponding to a root subsystem, then this U, the reflection subgroup, is, is equal to a WP. If and only if the, the root subsystem that you start with is so-called complete. That means it is not properly contained in a root subsystem of the same rank. Okay, so you have a criterion for actually doing this step. Where was it? The second step here. So you get a criterion which you can also implement on the computer that actually checks it. Um, so this is also an algorithm now. You can, I haven't implemented it as an algorithm, but uh, it's very easy. You can just to do it and you could just have a button and you get all the classes out, right? all the semi-simple classes. And in our case, the, the classification then is this. So we get 11 groups of semi-simple elements. And here's the type of the root subsystem in the second column. And this is then the, this is then the so-called the vector spaces. And these are the, the set CP nodes, okay? They're, they're, conditions on the parameters here. So you see that every class consists, ex except the last one, it just cons consists of zero. But maybe here we don't consider zero because we already considered it with the um, nil potent orbits. No? Anyway, but all classes, they, 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 they consist of parameterized families, right? And here there are some conditions on the parameter parameters. For example, the last class here is just all multiples of U1, which are not zero, right? So you get a Sarisky open set, and here you, you get a little group that says whether they are conjugate or not. So in the last class, uh, uh, lambda times u1 is, is conjugate to minus lambda times u1, and that's it. Um, okay. So maybe if you get rid of the last class, which you don't consider, so it's just zero, you get 10 classes of semi-simple elements. 
So these are then 10 of the infinite classes that we get. Okay. So now we go to the to the mixed orbits. So mixed orbits are neither semi-simple nor nilpotent. So they, cons they consist of elements that are semi-simple element plus a nilpotent element, and both these elements commute. Now I will not say much about this, but um, it's an obvious. I, I, if, if I've already classified the semi-simple elements, then I can try to classify the mixed elements that have a given semi-simple element as semi-simple part. And so classifying the mixed elements with a given semi-simple element P is the same as classifying nilpotent elements uh, that commute with P up to conjugacy by the centralizer of P in the group. I mean, if you haven't seen this before, maybe this is a bit, this is probably a bit fast, but anyway, this is, if you think about it, this is obvious. No? It's, it's not very difficult. It's just translating what, it mean, what, what, what the Jordan decomposition says, more or less. No? And this, this already gives how to do it. Because if I, if, I, if I start with a P, yeah, I take one P from the semi-simple classification. Now one, in one of the spaces CP I naught yeah, that I determined earlier. I take its centralizer in the big Lie algebra. And here it's very important that all elements of the same CP I naught have the same centralizer. So that's very important because otherwise it wouldn't be possible to do this. Then this centralizer is also graded because you just intersect with the grading of the Lie algebra. And then you just use the methods that I sort of indicated before to classify nilpotent orbits to classify the nilpotent Z not P orbits in A1. Hmm. So that's just a, 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 let's say an easier classification of nilpotent orbits. And then you get all nilpotent parts that this P can have as, as a mixed element. Um, okay, so the result is a finite list of nilpotent elements that are the possible nilpotent parts of mixed elements with semi-simple part and CPI naught. Fine. So I will, I will not go into that. I will also not, not, not display the list of all these things. But this gives then the other, other infinite classes, right? Because each CPI naught was an infinite class. For each class, I get a finite number of nilpotent or not nilpotent elements. And then I get, so I get an, a corresponding amount of new infinite classes. And if you count them all together, you get 87 classes. Anyway, uh, basically, so this, we did this, well, because we wanted to do the real classification. And it's basically all based on work of Wienberg and co-workers and students on the 70s. So I was personally quite surprised that this was not present, that, that nobody had done this already. I mean, it's, it's apparently not done yet. <laughs> but anyway, so I think it's, it's you can you can sort of a project like this you can you can sort of classify as as so-called low low hanging fruit, right? Uh, well, of course, if if you know the work from Greenberg, yeah, then it's sort of very easy to do this, and apparently nobody has done it. So well, fine. Okay. Now. Um, so there are no questions about the, you know, questions about the complex thing. We can also ask questions later if you like. I come to the thing over the real numbers. Um, and these are called rebits. So the complex thing were called qubits. And these things are called rebits. And there's much less literature about rebits than there is about qubits. But there is some. So rebits uh, uh, is the same thing, but now over the real numbers. Mm -hmm. And as it so happens that the classification over R is of interest in the theory of black holes. And here is, is the, the, the terminology is the so-called STU model. And this explains the presence of the fourth co-author, uh, Alessio Marani, because he's an expert on that, that sort of thing. So he's an expert on supergravity and black holes and all these uh, things. And well, but we, uh, so I and the other mathematicians on the team, <laughs> we just do the, the algebraic part of the thing. And uh, the, our main tool for obtaining the classification over R is, is Galois cohomology. Okay, and this, uh, um, this follows a collaboration by, uh, uh, that I, I had with um, Mikhail Borovoy and uh, Hong Van Le. 
where we did another case and well, which actually is much more difficult. Okay, <clears throat> and I'll just say, say some words on how this works. So first, um, well, a very basic idea of how Galois cohomology works. Um, now, if you start with a in the G1, so now I, I consider the complex G1, right? The same thing as before, the complex thing. And I take an X in there, and I suppose it's real. So it means that it's fixed under conjugation, right? So I take a real element in my module of the complex module, right? And you take the complex orbit of this X, right? So I determined previously all these orbits, right? So I take one. I take a complex orbit of, an, of a real element now. And what you want to know is the real orbits in the, let's say, in the set of real elements of the orbit. So the O is the complex orbit. I take the real elements in that orbit, uh, those that are fixed under conjugation. And then I want to know what are the SL2R to the four orbits in this O of R. Mm -hmm. And if I can do that for all real X, then I have determined all real orbits. Hmm. So that's principle. Of course, it's well. There's well, yeah. Of course, there's a, there's an immediate question. If you have an infinite number of orbits as you had before, how do you run over all real x? But anyway, we will come to that later. Um, and to use this with Galois cohomology, what you do is you define the centralizer or the stabilizer of X. So this is a, the complex stabilizer. Yeah. And then you define the, <clears throat> the first cohomology set. So an element in this G naught X is a co-cycle if uh, a G, if G times its complex conjugate is the identity. So those are co-cycles. And two co-cycles are equivalent if there, uh, so G1 and G2 if there is an if there is an H with this property here, so the H inverse times G one times the uh, conjugate of H is G two, so that's an equivalence relation, and the set of equivalence classes is called the first cohomology set and is denoted by the H one of Z naught X. No? so that's the H one, and the big theorem here is is that the the SL2R to the four orbits are classified by this H1. And the theorem is actually explicit, or well, yeah, it's more or less explicit. And if I, if I have the H1, then I can also find representatives um, of these orbits, of these real orbits. Um, okay, fine. So that's more or less how it works. Um, but, Important here is that I start with a real element. Okay, I need to take the centralizer of a real element. Okay. Okay, so now uh, let's say, uh, now I, uh, also in the real case, uh, we have the same, uh, the same division into types of orbits. So I've, I've got nilpotent orbits, semi-simple orbits, and mixed orbits. Okay. Um, and first we go, well, we have a look at the real, at the nil potent orbits. Um, well, and, 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 and uh, as a general theorem, it's possible to prove that every complex nil potent orbit has a real representative. So we don't have the problem of the term of finding, you now we have a finite number of real orbits, of, of nil potent orbits, and each has a real representative. So we don't have a problem, we don't have a problem with this finding a real element. Now, uh, instead of, um, just working with a real representative, we work with a real SL2 triple. And we take this, the, the, the centralizer of this SL2 triple. So that's the elements that centralize the three, all, all three of these elements or stabilize all three of these elements. And the, the corresponding H1. And then we obtain all real nilpotent orbits. And I'm not going to show you the table. It's basically you take the, the what, what you do, <laughs> Um, if you, you take the, um, the, um, the complex nilpotent orbits, you have representatives that are tensor, that are sums of tensors with all coefficients one, and then you obtain all real by, by putting a lot of plus or minus ones. Okay. So that's more or less how you get so many orbits because there's a lot of plus or minus ones. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. 
we get 145 nil potent orbits in this in this case. Uh, so you see that in the real case, there are many, many more nil potent orbits than in the complex case, because in the complex, there were 31. Okay. And it so turned out that 101 of these orbits, they turned out to be relevant to the study of extremal black holes. And that's a paper of some years ago by uh, Daniela Ruggieri and Mario Trigiante from Turin, uh, with whom we worked together. Actually, we worked this out already with different methods. Um, maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. No, a little bit less, maybe. I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> uh, but with, with Galvaco homology, it's actually much easier. So we, we redid it just for uh, private. So we didn't publish it, but we, we, redid, we redid it with Galvaco homology, and it comes out much easier, <laughs> which is uh, sort of funny. Um, um, <clears throat> anyway, now the the real nilpotent, uh, the real semi-simple, the real semi-simple orbits, yes. Uh, what happens there? Uh, in the real semi, the, the, the real semi-simple orbits are much more difficult because it is possible that the orbit of a non-real element in my given Cartan subspace. So remember, all my uh, semi-simple elements in the classification they lie in a given Cartan subspace C. Now I can take an element in this Cartan subspace C, which is complex, non-real, but its orbit has real elements outside of the Cartan subspace. And that's uh, that makes for difficulties, you know? And how do we get about this? Well, if we fix such a set CP naught, yeah, one of these sets, one of these parameterized sets that were in the classification. Um, <clears throat> and recall that two elements of the CP naught are conjugate under the group, if and only if they were conjugate under the small group gamma P. Then we compute the H1 of gamma P, so the, the Galois cohomology set. Okay. And we consider a complex orbit of a Q in this CP naught. And then there is this theorem from our paper with uh, Mikhail Borovoy and um, Hong Van Le, um, <clears throat> which says that this O has a real, this, this, this orbit O as a real point, right? Um, if and only if uh, I can find a Q prime in, in, in the orbit, but also lying in CP naught, that satisfies this equation, where the, the, the conjugate of Q prime is equal to the inverse of a C of, of one of these representatives here times Q. And if this is the case, then we can also determine such a real point, right? So this, this this Q prime will not be a real point because of this because of this because well only if CI is the identity it will be real but if CI is not the identity this Q prime will not be real but we can def determine a real point in its orbit and then we go on like before with the Galois cohomology no? okay um, well. <clears throat> um, this um, uh, we uh, yeah so we 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 execute this idea and an important point is that it works so we can do this because all elements of CP naught have the same stabilizer in SL two to the fourth right because I can then compute all stabilizers so I have a good I have a good control over the stabilizers because we need the stabilizer to do the Galois cohomology. Yeah. Okay, so I will not show you uh, the tables because they're, they're, so they, they, they comes out many many long tables. Yeah? So this, in this case, the, the number of real orbits is really much larger than the number of complex orbits. Uh, also, in this case, we can determine, for example, right? So in in the so I haven't written it, this on a slide, but you can have the same definition of a Cartan subspace of a maximal. Uh, a maximal uh, subspace consisting of commuting semi-simple elements. <clears throat> and in uh, the complex case, there is up to conjugacy, there is one Cartan subspace. In this case, uh, for the real um, classification, there are seven Cartan subspaces, right? So, and each of those Cartan subspaces, they have, they have 
representatives of orbits. So it's, no, it gets a bit more complicated, or it gets a lot more complicated. And actually, you can look up our paper if you like uh, in a, on the archive, and it contains a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of tables. So, uh, um, yeah. And now our future project. What's that? Is to do this for a symmetric pair of maximal rank of the in this Lie algebra of type E7. So now instead of D4, we have E7. And as you know, E7 is much bigger than D4. <clears throat> it's much higher dimensional. And there the G0 is SL8. And the G1 is the wedge 4 of C8. And I expect at least 200 pages of tables or something like that. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, I think that's a good point to stop. Um, so, ah, well, yes, and then there's of course the, 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 the next orbits. I, I will not, uh, I, I don't. We also have then Galois cohomology methods for doing those, but I will not, I will not go into that. Um, okay, then thank you. Yes. Yes, thank you very much, dear William. So uh, let me come on that uh, the last case uh, of future project is uh, uh, concerning the classification of the yeah perform on uh, uh, C eight uh, uh, on the D did by Antonian but there's uh, some, some uh, missing classification and uh, <clears throat> on the real cases uh, much more interesting you know that's a geometry of the uh, low dimension for form in the uh, R eight has been considered by several people but they consider only a passion reason and uh, that is uh, i think that's a that this projection has the um, many implication for geometry in law dimension and uh, from another collaborator in the project uh, <clears throat> just uh, andreas santi he says that also has a uh, could be implication in some um, uh, a, a super symmetry, right, uh, William? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, this is also of this is also a case of interest for the black holes and things. Yeah. Uh, yes, black hole. <laughs> so, Igor, do you also know black holes uh, relation? Is this a thing? Uh, this this particular relation, I I don't know. Uh, it, does it have to do with super uh, super symmetric black holes and super gravity somehow? Yeah, it's super gravity. Yeah, so this I, I don't know much about. It's the, it's the, so it's the, the point is, well, this was what I was explained, <laughs> is that you have, you have the Einstein equations of gravity. That's what it starts with. And then you have several models somehow and uh, of, of black holes or something, and they are acted upon by these by the so the, the 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 representation so that they have a symmetry group which is very large which is sort of sort of this this SL8 for example and the the module that is of interest is this is this wedge four then now it somehow comes out of the so the symmetric pair comes out of the out of the out of the physics and then they are interested in the real orbits because they no but that's more or less that's all that's all I know. Yeah. <laughs> so William yeah. from the on the classification of the you consider only four qubits and the qubits only and you can four the corresponding to some degraded Lie algebra, right? On other cases. Say it again. You, uh, consider classification of the n qubit. So only n you can four. Yes, yes. Have yes, the yes. easy to uh, grade it. Yes. So by uh, uh, that is very easy to uh, to see, right? Uh, you have to uh, how to say? Uh, uh, not sure, but it's known. Uh, so the 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 um, so there's this there's this classification by cuts of so-called um, visible representations of algebraic groups. I think in 1980 or something as a paper. And that's sort of you, you can see them as as the representations but that, that have a finite number of nilpotent orbits. And this one, so the, the four qubits is, is is still visible, but five qubits is no longer visible. 
uh, and six and seven and so on. So um, if you go if you go for higher end, then already the nil, the nil potent orbits will be an infinite number. So I see. So that's a past observation. Yes, 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 yes. Well, yes, it's yes. But in any case, it's it's, it's known that 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 for higher end, it's. It's impossible to have any <clears throat> have an orbit classification in any sort of detail. So maybe you, you can divide again. You can divide maybe the orbits in groups. You know, find a number of groups, but uh, but to get some to get close to an orbit classification is not possible. At least not with the methods that are currently known. <laughs> yes. So do you know some implications around uh, quantum information theory? Uh... <laughs> uh no um well there's there's questions so i don't know i mean uh, um, also um i didn't find any papers saying ah now we have this classification uh, and now we can do the following but apparently apparently one problem is to reach quantum states so the so the people who do a quantum information, quantum computing and so on, they want to go from one state to the other or, or something like that. And then uh, they want to do it. So they also would like then maybe if you have a given state, they want to transform it to a, maybe if you have some code of sign of classification, a given state, transform it to some normal states that's, that is in your classification. They want to do it with certain operations that they can, you know, uh, in, mm -hmm. need an element of the group mapping one state to the other and then factorize it in terms of certain given. But anyway, I don't know much about it, but uh, yeah, there, there is kinds of problems. So. <laughs> okay, is there some more question? So if not, uh, let us thank the speaker again.